is, is nothing except a, a proxy for how the world sees it on, with the exception of a few countries officially, and perhaps with the exception of a large population of pro-Iran sentiment, partially Shia, but also politically, there's many people across the world, including in the US, uh, who feel that Iran has gotten a really bad deal um, over the last 40 years or so. What is the current sort of consensus view in Washington about how Biden is going to tackle this kind of, you know, post deal uh, undoing of the deal by Trump and everything that's happened since. And I think two or three things that I'd like you to touch upon in kind of your big overview. Number one, of course, is the, is the, uh, the taking out of the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Um, I think it's also important to talk about the uh, different kind of relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia in particular during the Trump administration. Uh, and then more widely, Iran hasn't gone over the edge because of the lack of a deal, uh, although there are things that have happened in Iran that are different. And obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you know Brian and Alex and, and Lukas who will who, who fill us in on many of these aspects. But big picture, what is Biden going to do with Iran? Yeah, well, it's a big question, but I think one of the first things to note is Biden um, coming in after Inauguration Day, I think, knows that he has kind of um, a fine rope to walk in terms of unwalking a lot of what the Trump administration has done over the past four years. And given um, that Iran has been um, now less so patiently waiting to see what the Biden administration is going to do, that action really is going to have to take the forefront. But of course, that's easier said than done. Um, I think notably there's going to be a time crunch, not from domestic pressure within the United States to see what Biden's going to do, but also the fact that Iran's own presidential elections will be approaching, which kind of puts us in a very narrow time frame to hopefully uh, make a lot of change happen. Um, Biden's statements that he wishes to return to the DCPOA, I think should be taken largely at face value. But that, um, you know, isn't so simple when it comes to the fact of what Iran has put on the table as far as demands, what they're actually going to be willing to do. And then, of course, the, um, you know, variable domestic pressures with the United States, of course, the opponents to the deal uh, and the opponents to kind of um, what Biden's Iran policy will be, um, will be largely vocal uh, about what Biden should be doing. I think in terms of what we're really going to see going forward. Uh, there's going to be a kind of a couple important things that Biden will have to do. I think first and foremost, Iran will be looking for some show uh, of confidence, of, of good faith from the Biden administration. Um, they've been making demands for compensation. I don't think you'll see Biden willing to fold to those, but hopefully you'll see some immediate action in terms of greater, you know, clarification on humanitarian trade, the establishment of a white channel, lifting of a travel ban, really to make sure that the Iranian regime and the Iranian people know that Biden actually, you know, his word can be taken at value, um, given kind of some of the Hippocratic hypocrisy um, that has kind of unfolded over the past four years. In terms, I think that will also kind of go a long way, hopefully, um, or will be intended to in terms of also the regional escalations that we've seen over the past year. You obviously mentioned the strike against Qasem Soleimani, um, but I think even the recent assassination, um, allegedly by Israel, of Iran's top nuclear scientists is going to be at, at the forefront um, of top of mind in kind of initial um, moves and, and, and conversations. Um, but then I think Biden will have to, if, you know, there is signaling from the Iran's, Iranians that they're willing to engage with the Biden administration, which I think is still is still a really big question if that will come to actually pass. There's going to be a lot of technical issues on the Biden side to actually unwind a lot of some steps the Trump administration um, took, which I hope we'll, we'll begin to talk about in more detail later on in the discussion. Thanks, Kelly. That's a that's a fantastic sort of overarching view. Lukash, I want to come to you uh, next because, uh, you know, from a kind of very linear uh, black and white sort of perspective, uh, when a lot of us sitting on this side of the Atlantic and this side of Istanbul, when we look at the world and we think, hmm, who's, who's looking at Iran fairly? Because we can never expect the Americans to do that because obviously they're just going to do what the what the Israelis or, you know, the Saudis want them to do when it comes to Iran. But uh, for some reason, uh, and, and there are many reasons, and I'd like you to talk about them, uh, 
a lot of folks expect the Europeans to kind of be a little more fair, uh, not to give or cut it on any, any unnecessary slack, but at least to not punish the people of Iran for uh, crimes and, and mistakes and you know, errors in judgment that the regime in Iran uh, you know, commits. Uh, what is, how is Europe looking at the Biden administration's uh, maybe return of America to kind of the, the seat at the table that Biden talked about himself in his uh, foreign affairs article? Uh, is that uh, universally being seen as something positive? Or there, are there two minds even in Europe, given that European politics itself has shifted so much further to the right and aligned in many countries with kind of the Steve Bannon school of thought that, uh, that so many in the U.S. seem to have fallen prey to? Well, you know, you put a lot on the table, so uh, I'll, I'll try to take it um, piece by piece. And it's interesting uh, that you started uh, with this idea that the Europeans uh, might be the, the honest brokers or the interlocutors, which basically uh, respect the arguments of both sides, because uh, certainly there are a lot of people in Europe who see themselves is in that way uh, as uh, this objective uh, objective actors, but of course we we are not. Uh, and uh, Europe and the European Union uh, has invested a lot in the JCPOA, the the, the nuclear deal. Uh, yeah, you go back to history, and it basically starts uh, with the trip of uh, three foreign uh, ministers of Germany, France, and the Euro and the United Kingdom uh, to Tehran back in two thousand three. So. All these years, uh, the European Union uh, has supported JCPOA, uh, sustained JCPOA, or tried to sustain JCPOA uh, after the United States uh, withdrew, uh, set up, uh, or some of the European countries actually uh, set up uh, a special mechanism for trading uh, with Iran, a mechanism uh, that is outside of the US dollar zone, uh, outside of SWIFT, so basically, uh, it avoids the, the U.S. sanctions. Um, so the uh, perception is in Europe is that we have done a lot to keep uh, the, the deal uh, alive. Uh, and in return, actually what we got uh, was criticism from both sides, uh, from the Trump administration. And there is a famous uh, quote from Secretary Pompeo that called the European the friends of the Ayatollahs. Uh, and from the Iranians uh, who are criticizing that the, the, the European Union is not really uh, sustaining its sides of the deal, that there are no enough investments, there isn't enough trade, uh, that this trade mechanism is not really working very well. So, of course, um, right now, uh, I, there is an expectation that we suffered so much, uh, of course, relatively speaking, to uh, the people in the region, uh, so uh, right now, this return to multilateralism that the Biden administration is proclaiming uh, would also involve the return uh, to JCPOA. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think there is no uh, room from being uh, naive. Uh, and people here in Europe uh, know perfectly well what the Iranians are doing in the region. So they expect Iran also to come back to full compliance. And I think a week ago, you had a, a pretty tough statement by the E3 countries. So again, Germany, uh, United Kingdom, and France, uh, basically saying to the Iranians, no, this is a space for democracy, for diplomacy. So please don't blow it at the last uh, uh, moment. Uh, and the last thing, uh, responding to your question about differences uh, in Europe, of course, uh, there are countries that uh, would are, are closer to the U.S. position under the Trump administration, closer also to the Israeli positions. Uh, but I think in generally there is a, a much more, there is an expectation that right now is time for, time for, for the, uh, the the, for uh, for diplomacy, not 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 for more sanctions, not for more tensions. Uh, thanks for that overview of uh, of kind of the European perspective, uh, Lukash. We'll come back to that, I think, momentarily. Alex, I, I wanted to ask you to maybe talk uh, us through a little bit of what what you've learned over the last few months, in particular, and I suppose especially um, in the last uh, month or so what the mood in Tehran and in Iran generally is in terms of the anticipation 
of the Biden administration. Uh, you know, I think, you know, you, you wrote, uh, I think in October this year that no matter who wins the US election in November, uh, the approach isn't gonna be limited to centrifuges in, in Iran anymore. Uh, and that signals, I think, a sense that a lot of people have that things have gotten more complicated for Iran from, from the perspective of what Iran has been up to, especially regionally. How does that get, how does that play out within Iran? How do, how do people view this, uh, this kind of worsening state of uh, Iran's positioning or stature with respect to the rest of the world, especially the US? Oh, thanks very much, Mashar. It's good to see you and it's good to be on the panel. Um, look, I mean, I, let me start with the region, since you asked about that first, uh, and then I'll turn over to the Biden presidency question. Um, there's no doubt that Iran right now, when it looks in the region and, and sort of wants to identify a win, um, it, it, the, the clear-cut wins don't exist anymore. I mean, a few years ago, you could say Iran was on the winning side in Syria. I'm not sure if that's convincing that many people anymore. I mean, we had the new Syrian foreign minister recently in Tehran, and the, you know, you just listen to the discussion in Tehran, and you, you sense more anxiety. What's happening in Syria? Can we recover our costs? What are the national security interests of the country of Syria almost a decade into Iran's involvement. These are some hard questions and there aren't easy answers or, or straightforward answers. And, you know, I can give you one example about, because you talked about the shifting dynamics in the region. For example, an Iranian concern is that um, the Israelis, together with the new uh, partners in the Gulf states and elsewhere, and the list seems to be growing now, um, you know, might want to focus on, on Syria as a place to hit back against Iranian uh, interests. How does that work out in practical sense? I guess the argument in Tehran is there'll be efforts made to bring Bashar al-Assad and his regime closer to the Gulf states, to the Saudis, to the Emiratis, others, promises of aid, promises of helping Assad, kind of, if you can, uh, re, uh, re, you know, brand himself, if that's possible, uh, but obviously what, what we would expect in return is that, um, you know, Assad distances himself from, from the Iranians. Is that going to happen? I have no idea of, of knowing it, but I can tell you that's the kind of fear the Iranians have. And if that's the kind of fear you have in Tehran, it tells you quite a bit about uh, their sense of being vulnerable to changes in the region. And it takes me to the, to, to the issue of what is Iran trying to achieve in the region? Right. I mean, this goes to the heart of the problem of the Islamic Republic with its own people. Your average Iranians don't want to be running around and spending the quite considerable amounts of money and resources that, that this regime in, in Iran has spent in the region in places like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq and Yemen. Some of the arguments that have been made in the past, for example, in the fight against ISIS in Iraq uh, on the grounds of national security, that might have been true back then a few years ago, but today, again, given what Iran is under in terms of sanctions and pressures, isolation, your average Iranian is wondering, what does it mean to me? Why should I uh, put up with it? Now, it's totally fair to say, who cares about the average Iranian? And that's fine, fair, and they've been angry for 42 years, pretty much going back to 1979. But the problem that the Islamic Republic faces is growing number of people are coming out in, in more frequent protests against the regime. In other words, and now I'm going to link it to the issue of Biden and sanctions. In other words, Islamic Republic of Iran increasingly has to ask itself the question, can I sustain my regional strategy? It's not so much the nuclear issue, it's the regional strategy. Uh, and because if they are going to have talks with the Biden administration, and they've known it for, uh, for a long time, um, they know they can go small, i.e. they can just talk about the nuclear issue, the number of centrifuges, how much they enriched, and so forth, or they can go big. Going big means you talk about the region. Not necessarily about Iran's human rights record, because frankly, look, in this part of the world, right now, I don't know if the United States even has the moral uh, position to start uh, preaching democracy in that part. So I'm not even sure democracy is, is, is going to be part of the conversation but certainly what Iran is doing in the region. And, you know, the Biden administration can, which is a fear in Tehran, which is to say, we ask of you certain things and you just simply make the concessions, which is what the hardliners in Tehran 
folks like the parliament speaker Ghalibov and others are, are warning against, that Iran has to make concessions uh, and that in, frank, in, in truth, the, the, the demands of the Biden administration will not be that different from say the 12 demands that Mike Pompeo put out in May of 2018. So uh, in other words, the issue of what Iran is doing to, in the region, the cost of it and whether it can sustain it has to be seen as a major driver in the calculations of the, of the Iranian regime. Uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader who this summer will turn 82, cannot afford or will likely not want to see the continuation of these sanctions. And I, know, and I know we're going to talk about Iranian presidential elections in June of this uh, 2021, but frankly, those elections don't matter. Uh, Iran's strategic policy uh, uh, policies, including what to do with the United States, really sits with the Supreme Leader and the Revolutionary Guards, and they're not going to go anywhere in June of uh, next year. So the question is, can you make a deal with them? I, I wouldn't be too much... Uh, concerned about the feelings of folks like Hassan Rouhani and, and Javad Zarif at this point. I, I really don't think that they are able to shape Iran's strategic policy going forward towards the United States in the short term. So why bother talking about it? But um, yeah, I mean, uh, go, just let me su summarize. Right now, Tehran is waiting to see, is Biden going to go for the biggest sets of demands of them? And in which case the Iranians have to sort of stick Stick, uh, st stand back and have a perhaps a reevaluation of the policies, or whether Biden administration is not going to try that and just say, you know what, we're kind of happy enough to go back to something that looks like the 2015 deal, and if that works, then we can perhaps build on it. But that's good enough for us. That that remains to be seen. That's that's the Biden team's call. Well, speaking of the Biden team, Alex, you've given me so much material there. There's a couple of instances there where I just wanted to jump in uh, and 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 really mix it up because you know there, there's a lot there that uh, that I think uh, a lot of people who watch this and will be watching it uh, would want to ask uh, with respect to, especially your categorization or description of the regime. We'll come to all that, and 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 I'll, I'll try to interrogate some of those issues or explore some of those issues a little bit uh, more deeply um, and and maybe we'll get into a sort of heated argument uh, fingers crossed but uh, before we do that Brian Katulis um, first I mean let me say and, and let me say this to everyone because I'm really sort of very rude when it comes to this but it's wonderful to have all of you and to be having this conversation on a personal note I think it's great that we get to renew and refresh uh, after the four years that the world has just experienced. And nothing against President Trump or any of the folks that, that worked for him, but uh, I think a lot of folks all around the world are slightly more comfortable with the kind of centrist uh, predictability that might come with a Biden administration. So I think that's part of the underlying assumption or, or supposition in, in the question that I wanna pose to Brian. But you know, uh, Alex, you talked about Biden's people, and and uh, you know, I don't want to accuse Brian of anything he's not guilty of. But Brian, you wrote in March uh, 2020, you, you and Peter Jewell published a, a document which some people might accuse uh, you of uh, of having basically written the blueprint for what the Biden administration is going to do as far as uh, Iran is concerned. And the, the title was "Putting Diplomacy First a strategic alternative for President Trump's maximum pressure approach on Iran. Just talk us through, I mean, you published this in March, so one is assuming you spent the last couple of months of 2019 and the first couple of months of this year uh, working on that. At that point in time, what was your sense of what might be possible if there was a new uh, regime or a new administration in, in the United States? And and what what was the impetus for kind of your broad conclusions in the document. Just walk us through the, the document and maybe also how things have changed since then. Great. Thanks, Musharraf. And it's really great to be with you. And I was thinking how many years it's been since I've actually been with you in Pakistan. And we've got to change that once this pandemic is done. But it's it's really lovely to see you and see my colleagues here. I should say that the the person who really wrote the blueprint for the incoming Biden administration is Kaylee and her colleagues. Uh, they put out a report at the Center for New American Security. And I think last week had a wonderful event with Rob Malley and a number of uh, other uh, colleagues. And I think- I was gonna bring that to her, but, but yeah, thanks yeah. for- 
it's 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 and it's similar and we have sort of maybe different views but what's what's really what, what you said about the refresh here uh, after four years of Trump is that no matter who's in office, there's always very thoughtful people, uh, believe it or not, here in America, and it may be hard to believe these days sometimes, uh, who are thinking through complicated issues like Iran. And to basically uh, try to summarize what we put out in this report, um, using the title of this seminar, uh, Old Deal, New Deal, No Deal, I would say it's elements of an old deal as a bridge to a new deal. Is, is the formula that we're proposing. It's a formula that I think a lot of people, um, uh, and, and it's how I read the CNAS report as well, it's how I read the incoming Biden team. And um, let, me, let me just pause here and say, I think this is what I'm about to say is an important point. I think um, people's expectations of how quickly the Biden team will be able to assemble its cast of characters on foreign policy, um, people need to lower the expectations because we really are in an unusual moment for a number of reasons. The transition has had some hiccups in part due to uh, President Trump's stance, but then we're in a pandemic. I mean, we're, we're sitting here in a country, I'm in Bethesda, Maryland, outside of Washington, DC, and we're, we're literally losing more people to the coronavirus every day than we did uh, in 9-11. And I, I, I link that to the transition because it actually presents a lot of practical challenges for some of my friends who are part of the team trying to assess policy on different fronts. This may seem like a, an extraneous point, but it's very relevant as I do worry that on files like Iran, which won't wait for the US to get its sort of plan together under Biden, um, we may actually have some element of home alone in terms of personnel and not having a full team on board through much of the spring into the summer. And as we've already talked on the panel, Iran and the Middle East won't wait for that. Events will sort of uh, shape the trajectory. Um, in essence, in our, our formula, um, one of the key points, and we've talked about it a bit here already, is that the missing ingredient from US discussions uh, on Iran, I think especially during the JCPOA time and immediately afterwards, was how do we improve the regional security environment? Um, Iran's threat perceptions are very real. Iran's neighbors' threat perceptions are very real, including in Pakistan, as you know, uh, with, with incidents in Baluchistan. So the regional security environment is often thought of as an afterthought or too complicating for the nuclear file. I, I suspect, and it really, a lot of it depends on what Iran's leaders uh, decide to do and how it positions themselves. I do think that some sort of, um, if they return to compliance in some uh, clear fashion, then I think the Biden administration would move to uh, return to compliance and then uh, start a broader discussion on the broader sets of issues. But but my key point here is that it will take some time. Uh, it will take a lot more time than people expect. Um, and uh, I think the, the the second key point is that it's linked to the regional security uh, dynamics. And there's a lot of insecurities every day. Uh, we see it with the assassinations of uh, nuclear scientists and the and the strike against Soleimani at the start of this year. And and we're not going to be able to solve all of the Middle East security challenges. But I think some uh, effort towards tactical incremental progress in some of the key arenas like Iraq, like Yemen, um, it, using diplomacy, which has largely, I think, been absent under the Trump administration um, on the Iran file, to, to try to improve the regional security environment. And, and, you know, as I think Alex and others have said, I don't see a grand bargain anywhere near in the offing. But what I think you'll see from uh, the, the incoming Biden administration is an attempt to try to actually uh, achieve some gradual progress, uh, both on uh, moving away from Trump's maximum pressure approach, which has failed miserably, and towards sort of engaging the broader regional dynamics to try to de-escalate tensions um, while America deals with a number of other issues. And it may not be, uh, I think it'll be quite unlike, uh, very much unlike what uh, we saw with Obama coming in in 2009. This probably won't be done with a lot of fanfare, with speeches and dramatic appointments of special envoys and, and other things. I actually think that there'll be an effort to lean on the people who are career uh, government, um, public servants, um, efforts to sort of quietly re-engage these issues and uh, with an expectation that we've got to be practical 
about what we can achieve. But I think the essential formula to sum up is to try to get back to elements of the old deal, but see it as a bridge to a longer term conversation on a new deal, but that new deal necessarily needs to include neighbors of Iran and others who were not part of the conversation back in 2014 and 2015. Brian, I just yeah, that's that's fantastic, and I think this issue of how long it's going to take is a really interesting one because I think the fear. Uh, let me express my my sort of fear or, or trepidation about what that might mean, and and, and also, you know, what what you think. Uh, just to get your reaction on this, the because of social media, a lot of the senior officials will have kind of this pulpit that, you know, everyone, all of us have now, which is to go on Twitter and express a norms level sort of, you know, benchmarking. We've already seen Jake Sullivan, I think, really express kind of, you know, the values-based agenda that, you know, uh, certainly the Biden administration would like to project. Um, but this posturing will be absent the kind of uh, the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts that, uh, that, you rightly pointed to that will take time. And I'm, I wanted to get your reaction on whether you think that the kind of the gutting out or the, I mean, maybe disembowelment is too strong a word, but certainly the State Department's capacity over the last four years uh, to do that nuts and bolts kind of detailing uh, of a relationship uh, isn't there. That's not going to be automatically renewed just because Biden and a thousand or 10,000 centrists um, that our Democratic Party affiliates are back in D.C., or, or is it? Uh, it won't be. And I would add to it, Musharraf, the challenge that we've seen even under eight years of Obama, and you saw this full well in Pakistan, all of the talk, and we could go back to a talk I think you and I did on Blogging Heads TV maybe a decade ago about uh, about... Yeah, about about empowering the State Department and using the tools of diplomacy and economics. And it was all fine talk, you know, and there was the the Kerry Luger Berman, which was the Biden Luger legislation. And in the meantime, the U.S. Uh, was engaged in a very aggressive drone campaign uh, that, uh, you know, I think complicated the security situation. So the, the broader challenge is one of the over militarization of US foreign policy that literally has been in play for two decades now since uh, since 9-11. So when we titled this paper on Iran, this uh, one that you mentioned in March, putting diplomacy first, we were serious about it. We were essentially trying to send the message, we need to get serious about it. It will take some time to get to that posture. It's not just simply you know, who's going to be in the mid-level deputy assistant secretary state positions and all of, because Washington right now has some of the worst gossip in the world. And it's really like pretty bad. It's sort of like, who's going to be the middle managers on problems that, again, it's important, but I, I dismiss I dismiss it in the sense that it's, you're, you're correct. I'm, I'm reinforcing your point by saying we've had an over-militarization of this, but I think that's led to these false choices on a number of issues, including interests versus values. Because the way I see U.S. engagement in the Middle East is that we need to actually engage on both. And when I think of the problem of Iran, we can't simply just talk about its nuclear program or its ballistic missile program or its regional activities. We need to raise uh, uh, the voice of uh, and the name of uh, people like Ruhollah Zam, who was executed by the regime this this weekend uh, in, in Tehran um, because he lifted his voice up in support of freedom and was challenging the regime. And it's so funny here in America is that quite often, this is my own view, many of the so-called progressives um, in our uh, landscape who do talk about democracy and human rights and human rights especially, quite often are a bit more muted when it comes to uh, basic rights of Iranian, uh, the Iranian people. And I understand why, because the politics of this are, are complicated here. They see too many people on the far right who do who do want uh, to, to support some sort of military regime change by America in Iran using those issues in a, in a bad way. But what I'm saying is that a holistic approach, one of engagement, uh, one not only with Iran, but I would ar argue Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE and other uh, Egypt, other countries that have really awful records on human rights and respecting basic freedom. W the US actually, I think if we put diplomacy first, we can engage on all of these questions. But my key point uh, related to the thing I said earlier is that we have to be modest about 
how much progress will be achieved on all of these fronts. But if we don't sort of raise up diplomacy, if we don't raise up these issues, they will be neglected and the continued militarization of US foreign policy will will continue almost, almost no matter what Biden and his team uh, would like to get done. So thanks, Brian. Uh, Kelly, just, you know, uh, relating this also to any insights that, that I'm sure, you know, came up during um, the CNAS event that uh, Brian sort of uh, very graciously mentioned. Um, this was the Biden administration and the future of U.S. and Iran relations, kind of a similar topic as the one we're having there, but obviously a fantastic panel there, too. Uh, to what extent, either on that panel or more generally in D.C., is there a consciousness of the complexity of the regional question? Because a regional question isn't just uh, kind of the, the export of revolution. I, I think at the heart of Iran's behavior is probably kind of, it is an ideological driven uh, state. And so it has a natural inclination to, to pump that out. Uh, in a country like Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, we see that play out from a sectarian perspective because obviously uh, a lot of Shias all around the world, especially those that have been besieged by, uh, you know, as minorities, um, they look to Iran as kind of, not a savior necessarily, but certainly a safe space. So they have this, out, uh, outstanding and outsized uh, influence that isn't just military or ideological, it's also, you know, soft power uh, and it wields that soft power, I think quite expertly uh, for, for, a, for a country that's been under sanctions and been poor for so long uh, relative to its adversaries. Today there was a there was an attack on a on a on a marine vessel um, just outside Jeddah in, in Saudi Arabia and, you know, immediately I was just trying to track the conversation around that. A lot of folks believe that this is obviously, uh, you know, conspiratorial, that the Israelis are doing this to try and make sure that there's some kind of a response and to make things more complicated. Not necessarily, uh, you know, getting into the conspiracy of it all, but there's certainly a lot of lobbying, cross lobbying. So the relationship isn't just DC Tehran, the relationship is DC Riyadh, DC Islamabad, DC Kabul, DC, Damascus, uh, Damascus, DC, obviously Tel Aviv, and all of those sort of cross channels uh, shape whatever's going to happen between between Iran and and uh, and the U.S. What level of preparation and what level of clarity do you think you know Blinken and and Sullivan and the and the wider team, the senior officials that have already been announced? Uh, do you think they have on on how they're going to manage all these different parts of the Iran puzzle? Yeah, I think um, I agree with a lot of uh, what Brian said to begin with. And when you take um, you know into account, I think this effort to return to diplomacy, and then as uh, Lucas said earlier, the return to multilateralism. Obviously, in the regional context, that doesn't you know just include the you know P five plus one, but also Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and and many other players. It's not you know just the Iran US pieces of the puzzle. And I think the Biden team um, is aware of that and is also aware of kind of the different directions that some of those more uh, bilateral relationships have taken over the past um, four years under the Trump administration. Obviously, uh, I think the uh, Netanyahu-Biden uh, relationship will look very different than the Netanyahu-Trump relationship. And so I expect Israel, um, between the United States and Israel, that uh, the Iran issue will really kind of be the forefront of any tensions there. I think in terms of um, you know uh, the GCC, um, there obviously there's been kind of close relationships between Saudi Arabia and, and some members of the Trump administration, which has kind of caused a backlash within other populations, uh, especially among progressives in Washington. But I think Saudi Arabia also saw um, under the 20, you know, September 2019 attacks on its oil facilities that the U.S. was not rushing to their defense and that, you know, there that really kind of put an emphasis on, on the threat that they faced. And, and while they have, you know, prioritized um, regional issues and, and kind of confronting Iran rather than engaging, that there was this kind of more urgent need for de-escalation that could bring them maybe into greater cooperation with the Biden administration than we saw um, with Obama in their original JCPOA experience. Um, I think, and, and this kind of goes to the report um, that me and my team wrote uh, that was released in August called Reengaging Iran, um, which does allude to diplomacy, but not quite so directly as, as Brian's uh, paper did. 
um, when we talk about the regional issue there, um, it really is going to have to be a long term, um, long term kind of kind of plan and and structure. And that's kind of why we maintain that it has to be at least somewhat separate from from the nuclear issue, um, because they're just not kind of on the same timetable in terms of how you're going to actually articulate and implement uh, solutions or or agreements on some of those points. I think when we think about regional tracks or regional solutions, our, our main um, conclusions there was that it a, needed to be multilateral. We kind of talk about a broader multilateral regional security forum um, to kind of have these conversations. And then I think too, with the United States, and I think some of this is happening already, but you talk about kind of what the perspective in Washington is. I do think that there needs to be kind of a push for, for greater pragmatism um, when you hear people in the United States say, oh, we need to get Iran out of Syria or, you know, Iran can no longer support Hezbollah. Those are very unrealistic policy objectives. Um, and they're not the kind of demands I think the United States should be making because mm -hmm. they just kind of force us really onto polar opposite ends and really don't leave enough trade space in the middle. Sure. On, on that question, that's exactly right. I mean, if you were to demand, uh, if the U.S. was to demand that kind of a say, concession or de-escalation of regional warfare, proxy warfare, uh, really, is there any way that, even as a thought exercise in D.C., when, when you have that conversation, uh, Kaylee, do you find folks kind of responding with, well, are we, are we ready to ask uh, maybe other countries in the region to de-escalate their response, even if we assume that Iran is the bad guy and Iran started everything, surely there's, a, there's some Newtonian dynamic there and from the other side, whether it's Saudi Arabia or it's, uh, other regional powers, uh, what is the what is that dynamic like in terms of the conversations you had in the in the run up to preparing your report? Yeah, I think there are obviously the region. The reason that we think such a kind of regional discussion would need to be multilateral is that the United States can't be the one necessarily offering all of the incentives in that bucket. If you're asking Iran to do things. Um, that means Israel, Saudi Arabia, um, other players in the region will, will also kind of have to make, you know, concessions as, as Iran um, might see it or as they might see it. And, and the U.S. needs to be part of that um, because they have leverage and, and involvement in the region and because of all of the close relations there. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's not a question of just what the U.S. would do. And that's why I think it kind of has to be a little bit separate from the nuclear issue because the nuclear issue is kind of more clearly this bucket of economic incentives for, you know, this, um, you know, constrainment of, of Iran's nuclear program. But when we're talking about the regional issue, it becomes much more complex. And that's going to be trying to kind of create this jigsaw puzzle of all of these, you know, actions that each country will have to take. Yeah. And, and I guess, you know, that's the perfect setup, uh, Kelly, for, for Lukash, maybe to respond to what the natural sort of question uh, after that is, if it's already that complicated just to have an Iran in its region conversation, when you pull in uh, Europe and Europe's interests in maybe de-escalating, at least the de-escalation part of it, you're not, Europe is not a coherent whole. I mean, I just think uh, just the last six or seven months, France's relationship with Lebanon, for example, or, you know, the way in which Angela Merkel has, I think, separated herself in terms of how, you know, she's positioned her views. I don't even know if all of it is, is German or not. So this idea somehow that it's the U.S. and Iran and then there's Europe and then there's the region is, is really, it's bunkum, right? Uh, each of the European players have very specific relationships, dynamics, interests, and stakes in, in this conversation. Uh, is, is, is that accurate? And, and just walk us through maybe three or four, I mean, maybe France, Germany in particular, those two, and then maybe the UK a little bit. What What is the what is the dynamic and how does Brexit affect all of this, if, if at all? I'm sorry to complicate things even further, but uh, you would need to add additional actors. Uh, Turkey, for sure, uh, but also China and uh, Russia that are part of JCPOA, are very active and have political, but also economic uh, relationship uh, with uh, Iran. Uh, so of course, uh, for them, 
Uh, this is also a, an interesting uh, game uh, to play. You look, for example, at the Russians. Uh, okay, Iran may be something that they can talk to uh, the Biden administration about uh, and maybe somehow offset all this negativity that is in the bilateral US-Russian uh, uh, relationship. So maybe from the Russian viewpoint, uh, you might signal that you can be helpful uh, in this uh, case. Uh, and, you know, unlike the Europeans, actually, the Russians can also help with some of the technical uh, issues connected with uh, setting the Iranian nuclear program uh, back to the JCPOA uh, terms in terms of what to do with the enriched uranium, what to do with uh, heavy water. Then you have the Chinese, and so please don't get me started on this. We can we can go back to the to the Chinese. Uh, later, but you talk about the Europe proper, uh, the European Union, um, and you know, let's be realistic here. There are very few people in Europe who wake up and go to sleep every day thinking about Iran uh, and uh, Iranian uh, policy. Uh, it is, of course, an interesting and important uh, challenge. It uh, there are links to all sorts of regional issues in the Middle East that we. Uh, we just discussed, but it is in the margins of all these more uh, urgent issues, uh, some of which you mentioned, uh, Brexit, internal problems within the European Union, but also responding to COVID and basically just uh, trying uh, to uh, survive. Uh, at the same time, when you look at the three countries that basically led uh, this outreach to Iran, uh, uh, United Kingdom, France, and, and Germany, uh, the UK is out of the European Union, uh, but the Iranian issue is one of few things that still brings these two, three countries uh, together. Uh, so uh, they are still continuing with the E3 format and with all sorts of consultations and having uh, joint proposals and uh, joint ideas, uh, which they will, I'm sure, put also on the table uh, in, in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, out of these three, uh, Germany has traditionally been uh, the most uh, modest one, uh, the one that always, almost always preaches uh, about the need of dialogue and engagement. Uh, both France and the UK, they have their issues uh, with uh, Iran uh, and their relationship is further complicated by their very close political links uh, with some of the leading Arab uh, countries uh, in the region, uh, political sphere, military sphere, uh, energy. Uh. So traditionally, for example, the French uh, have put very much on the table the issue of the uh, Iranian ballistic missile program, not because they are worried themselves about the security of France, but they are worried about the security of some of their uh, partners in the region. Uh, the UK has also its own issues, some connected with a uh, very complicated historical uh, relationship with the Iranians. Uh, and uh, to all of the European Union countries, I think it's important to underline that the issues of, of human rights situation, of human security, um, is not really an afterthought. Uh, so after the uh, judicial killing of Ruhol Aksam, uh, you had uh, a very strong EU statement. You can say it's only a statement, but there it is. Uh, but also the EU representative pulled out of a, a major conference that was supposed to discuss a trade between the EU and uh, Iran, and the conference was uh, rescheduled. Uh, so the European Union usually does things in pillars. So there would be the non-proliferation pillar, there would be the pillar of trying to reach out to the Biden administration saying, you know, how can be, we be helpful to you also in the regional setting? And there'll be also a pillar uh, connected with human rights. Thanks, uh, Lukas. Alex, you know, obviously the human rights issue uh, is, is one that's come up a lot. Um, but let me be a little bit provocative, uh, as, as I promised earlier. You know, we, we hear the human rights issue on Iran, but when the U.S. is in a rush to leave Afghanistan, um, I, you know, Afghan women are largely on their own, so is Afghan civil society, almost all of which has con been constructed under the canopy of U.S. protection, uh, particularly in Kabul, but in some of the other cities as well. 
there's an activist that Iran hung, uh, terrible and, and, and blood curdling for sure. But, you know, the lead Iranian scientist is, you know, taken out. Um, there isn't the same kind of, you know, uh, uh, valuing of human life or due process uh, or what have you. I think, again, the issue is not just about how the Iranian regime feels. And I think you're right in distinguishing between kind of the hard, deep state in Iran and, and kind of its soft face with Javad Zarif and, and others. Uh, frankly, I think even a lot of Western democracies enjoy that kind of dual, uh, dual-headed uh, uh, presentation. Obviously, it's more stark and more obvious in a, in a country like Iran. Um, and of course, many would accuse, you know, Pakistanis of, of uh, having partly the same problem, although I think the dimensions and um, uh, the, uh, the, the temperament of those, of those polls would be, would be very different. But how do, you, how do you build in an assessment of these kind of challenges uh, in terms of the duality uh, from a norms and values perspective into the analysis? Or uh, do they not matter? And, and, and actually what matters is the nuclear program, uh, nuclear program, uh, regional peace, and regional peace being on the terms of Iran's adversaries rather than uh, anyone else's. Yeah, no, you put me on the spot. I mean, as you know, Musharraf, I'm of Iranian background myself, so I don't look at the issue of Iran just as a policy file. I mean, it. you know, I read, I listen to the stories in Persian every day, what's happening to the 82 million uh, of the people who live in Iran. For me, this isn't about centrifuges, the types of centrifuges and all the rest of it. So many of us who are Iran watchers, we are emotionally attached on a whole different level. But let me try and put, take a step out of the, that you know, emotional mess that you can get involved in and just look at it in terms of what it means for United States national security. Look, you're right. I Iran is not the only actor running around in the Middle East. Uh, sp you know, spending money on proxy groups and doing things that the sovereign state really shouldn't do. And I can go down the list. You all know the names of the countries. Some of them have already been mentioned. Yes, the Iranians aren't the only ones. We all know that. Uh, but we got to go back to the issue of what's what's at stake between U.S. and, and Iran. And I think, that, you know, history teaches us for 42 years, going back, and people are going to hate me for saying this, but it started with the hostage crisis in November of 72, when Jimmy Carter was president. And for the last 42 years, there has been a number of attempts by the American side to talk to Iran, to bring Iran in uh, to, to sort of, if you will, not back into the arms of the United States, but certainly not have fall into the arms of other countries that definitely have <laughs> the U.S.-Iran relations improve. And I think it's no secret that Russia and China presumably are doing everything they can to keep the U.S. and Iran remaining at loggerheads. It makes perfect geopolitical sense from their vantage point of view. So you, you want to understand why U.S. and Iran relations are tense. And I'm not saying the U.S., by the way, has been totally innocent in this. No, U.S. has done certainly things against this uh, Iranian regime that from the perspective of the re regime was not uh, helpful in building up confidence. But my point is that's the history. So let's not forget who decided to uh, turn uh, the other one into the, uh, you know, the nemesis? In this case, the, the Khomeinist in Tehran wanted uh, and got the United States as their enemy. And I'm not sure if the most powerful elements in Tehran are ready to give up on that yet. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the Khomeini's age, the Iranian Supreme Leader, just a few moments ago. The Iranian succession process is underway, Right. We talk about the presidential elections, and I said it's not significant. It's not in the context of the nuclear issue. We can talk about the optics of, of giving Rouhani a gracious exit before he leaves, and so he has something he can you know, call a win and blame it all on Trump. But, but the fact is, the presidential uh, elections in about half a year's time in Iran are about a further consolidation uh, by hardliners and people like or dislike that term, but it's an easy way of identifying people around the Supreme Leader Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards who, uh, who believe that they have a right, they have a chance to consolidate power, and that consolidation of power cannot be done if they give up anti-Americanism, at least not till they've made it to, to the point where they have full, uh, full control, and arguably already have full control, but I think 
it, it would be a, a mistake for us not to, because we're talking about third-party actors. I mean, we, we just discussed how Riyadh is a player, how, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi or Ankara and others are players. But Iranian domestic politics is a huge player in shaping Iran's attitude towards the United States. And unfortunately, uh, as, far, as far as I can see it, there are folks in Iran who really uh, care far more about having as much power as they can domestically than they're interested in uh, opening up the path of diplomacy with the United States because they see that as a path that could get out of control. It could be a slippery slope. They might end up having to make or be asked to make concessions that they don't want to make because if they end up making some of these questions about how they treat, for example, um, you know, human rights activists or dissidents in general, then the nature of the Islamic Republic would radically transform overnight and it would stop being what it is and they'll lose as a result in that process. So, Musharraf, you talked a lot, well, not a lot, but you mentioned uh, Iran's soft power in the region. You know where the Iranian regime doesn't have any soft power? is inside of Iran. They don't have credibility. They might have recruit Afghans, Fatimun or Pakistani Shia Zainab Yun or Iraqis and Syrians and maybe some Houthis. But Iranian soft power inside of Iran doesn't really exist anymore. And that is the regime's problem. So from their own point of view, if they really want to take a step back and look at where they are, where they're going, um, I think they want to reevaluate everything, including their regional policy, including where they stand in the United States, including uh, the issue of Israel. I mean, we don't talk much about Israel, but look, it's, it's the elephant in the room. And 1979, Iran could turn around and use Israel as a way of sort of appealing to the Arab street, but the Arab world is going in a whole different direction. And the Iranian people don't have grievances against Israel because there is no history of animosity. So the Iranian regime now has to answer for its pursuit of an ideological foreign policy that is damaging Iranian national interests everywhere you look, basically. I mean, a good example is what just happened in the South Caucasus. Right, Iran is busy in Syria and Turkey just moved in next door to the north and has taken a nice firm position. This is another classic example how, of the Iranian regime. And I'm not a defender of the Iranian regime. I'm just saying from their own perspective, if they pursued Iranian national interest, they do a lot more in terms of nation building at home, dealing with the grievances of their own people. And yes, engage in a conversation about regional security, but stop having some of these uh, red lines like they don't want to talk to the United States. They don't want to recognize Israel. I mean, you can't really have a sustainable long-term deal once those Iranian red lines remain in place. And they, they just simply have to rethink those. But I'm not sure it's going to happen while Khamenei is still alive. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a sobering, sobering uh, uh, assessment, uh, Alex. I, uh, Without, without reacting to that, I want to pick up on something Lukas said, and we'll come back to what's happening inside and on. I'm going to take a question around that to, to Kaylee. But Brian, for you, the, you know, Lukas kind of said, don't get me started on China. And, uh, you know, um, I think I will, uh, um, but, but I'm going to, I'm going to make you sort of, you know, or, or ask you to kind of respond to, to the question. And it's not just China. If you look at the positioning, I mean, Lukas presented, Russia as potentially a kind of um, an actor that would see Iran as a place that that would help bridge some of the gap between uh, the U.S. and Russia. Uh, an alternative uh, reading of it might be that Iran will become the touch point that will further exacerbate uh, and will give op an opportunity to hardliners in both Moscow and Beijing to double down. We just saw something like a $400 billion dollar uh, you know, mother of CPEC uh, kind of a commitment um, uh, program that was that was talked about. The Chinese haven't said a lot about it, but it was reported within Iran and outside that the Chinese are making this big uh, kind of BRI type push into Iran. Uh, when the Chinese do something like that, or you know, when when the Russians kind of do things that help Iran in any way or signal uh, help for Iran. What is that likely to do in terms of reactions from the U.S.? And, and I think what I'd love for you to talk about also, Brian, is not just the external aspect of it, but internally, given that Biden is a centrist, how much of that centrism is going to go toward appealing to the left, uh, to the AOC, AOC wing of his own party, and how much of it is going to be about catering to 
the right wing so that he doesn't lose half the country because you just did have about 70 million people vote for Donald Trump. Yeah. So f first on the strategic question in China and Iran, there's actually a myth uh, in the U.S. foreign policy discussion that has reemerged today. And the myth is this, is that we can somehow pivot away from the Middle East so that we're better, uh, uh, we're, we're more capable of competing with China and Russia. And that myth actually ignores everything that has happened over the last five to 10 years in the Middle East. Um, in that Russia has punched far above its weight in places like Syria and around the region and has become more of a factor uh, in the region. And then China uh, has, uh, I think, what is uh, a long game. I was in Beijing with some senior colleagues of mine in 2015 when the Yemen war began. And I was at a dinner seated next to um, a Chinese general, and I asked this general, "What are you? What are you going to do?" And she said, "It was a female general." She said, "We're going to get any of our citizens out, because our goal and role in the Middle East is to try to expand our economic and energy connections. But you guys can just, you Americans can can deal with all of the complicated security problems. Uh, we're 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 not going to get in the middle of it." So China's had this long game where it doesn't. Uh, I think in key places like Israel and some of the Gulf states, it's deepening its uh, ties to some of the tech and military industries there. Uh, but America is still stuck on this strategy or so-called strategy that it's had for the last 20 or 30 years. It really has not adapted uh, to, to sort of this new landscape. And you see that in this myth that somehow we're going to execute an Asia pivot 2.0. If you remember, Obama talked about doing that as well. And pretty rapidly, what we found is that uh, the US uh, it was engaged back in the Middle East because of ISIS, because of the Iran challenge in, in Obama's second term. So I think you understand the point is that you can't, in today's geopolitical environment, you can't sort of think of uh, global security as the game of risk, you know, the game that you play with your kids that has the armies on the board. It's more like Jenga, uh, the, the, P, the thing where you pull pieces out and you have to be very careful because it's very much intertwined and America's role is, is there. On your second question, the political one, look, I have my own view on this. And I think the, the, the key thing uh, to highlight, which is different uh, in 2021 compared to 2009, is that almost all of these security challenges and issues that that we're paid to sort of look at and examine, they don't have the p political salience today as it did in 2009. Obama did a couple of uh, many dramatic things in signaling in his first year, if you remember this. He went to Turkey and Egypt and gave speeches to the, to the Muslim world. He appointed envoys at the State Department, I think, on his second day in office. I'd be really surprised that the um, uh, president like Biden would actually even be able to do that just because of the sheer magnitude of the challenges here at home with the pandemic and economics. But he wasn't elected on any of these issues. Um, uh, nobody really cared about the thing we're talking about, except sort of elite sort of politics on, on all of this. Uh, as far as the, uh, I, I often use the so-called progressive left because what I've seen is just a lot of empty sloganeering on authoritarianism and human rights. Um, and I, I know this, I know some of my former colleagues who went to different campaigns and different candidates. And it truly is empty sloganeering when you look at sort of their positions on Syria, which has been in my view, the, the uh, move the goalposts on issues like responsibility to protect the very sanctity of human life, which had already been eroded. But Russia, I think, blew through that. And many of the so-called progressives in America were just sort of shrugged their shoulders or put their head in the sand um, about those issues. When it comes to the how the primary went down and how uh, congressional elections, not only in 2020 or 2018, I think you have this dynamic here where there are are important voices on the on the left in America that raise important issues, um, but they're not representative of where I think most of the country actually is. And I think this is explains why Biden has landed where he's landed so far on many of the appointments, is that you've got a lot of noise on social media.
which again, some of it is actually really important. And the, and the criticisms I largely agree with. What, what often is not there is an actual plan and a coherent sort of approach. So I think the the first thing I'd say, and you know, I I've I've talked with uh, the president-elect Biden in previous eras when he was a senator. In fact, when I was in Pakistan, I had a late night milkshake uh, at a hotel with him, and he knows these issues very very well. He he's probably people forget this. He's probably more knowledgeable of the world than any U.S. president who's entered office in, in at least my lifetime. In part because he's spent so much time. Uh, investigating these challenges and issues. So I think he's going to be uh, more pragmatic. And by that, I wouldn't, uh, he, he would just try to figure out what works. And this dynamic that we've had in America that I think has been very unfortunate, the hyper politicization of national security, we saw it under George W. Bush. We've seen it in some elements of the left uh, that, again, don't really have the votes that I think some people think they might when you just look at Twitter accounts, uh, but they don't matter as much in terms of political power. Uh, again, they, some sometimes they have decent ideas that should be integrated, but I think Biden ultimately will be pragmatic, uh, meaning he'll try to do what works. And my hope is that he'll try to sort of tamp down what has been, uh, on the, what has been the hyper politicization of security questions because coming back to, and I'll close here, issues like Iran, I actually think those divisions in America are exploited by countries like Iran to, to, to enhance their own strategic advantage. We've seen it with Russia and China. And that's where, again, I'm not, I think we should have full debates on the level, to be clear, uh, within our own society, and those debates will be exposed, and within the Democratic Party, oftentimes those debates are not on the level. You know, they're often done in terms of character assassination and other things. Um, but ultimately, we should present a more unified face uh, to the world than we have over the last ten or fifteen years, because the divisive hyperpoliticization has been exploited, like uh, by, by regimes in Tehran and Riyadh, and governments in Moscow and, and Beijing as well. You've you've put a lot on on my on my plate in terms of things that I would you know want Kaylee and, and Lukash and Alex to respond to uh, Brian. That I, but but I think let me start with maybe uh, and maybe unfairly to you, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with what you're saying and present it to Kaylee. I'm just pre warning. Sure. Um, yeah, sure. So so I think Brian might be might be stuck afflicted with with something that I know I am too, which is this kind of yearning for uh, reason uh, as, as dictating, you know, big ticket uh, questions of public policy. Uh, and I, I suspect that Twitter and increasingly TikTok and Insta matter more in foreign policy than the combined weight of the paper that you and Brian wrote uh, or, or that Alex, uh, you know, the writing that Alex has done over the last four years in particular, um, or, or the writing that any of us do. And, and so I guess, and the reason why that's important is that in, in terms of, you know, when we speak to the sentiment that Alex is talking about inside that on, I mean, we know about it and, and we, it exists in part because the algorithms exist to the extent that they do, you know, the Iranian people or some, some portion of them, you know, one can, one can disagree or challenge Alex on whether, you know, the, the Iran that he's talking about is all Iranians or 50% of Iranians or 20% of Iranians. But the, the bottom line is that, the, the sentiment on the street, the way that things are articulated on Twitter does matter. And so the partisanship that has driven so much of the conversation around Iran uh, will matter. And of course, I think the one country that Brian missed out on in terms of, you know, uh, the exploitation of the United States, of course, I would say two countries, but India doesn't really matter in this equation, although India also got a waiver on the sanctions uh, when it wanted to. But th that, that country is Israel. Israel consistently basically gets the U.S. to do its bidding when it comes to the question of Iran. Is that going to continue or or do you see, are you more hopeful? Uh, are you hopeful in the way Brian is hopeful that President Biden, being the wily sort of fox that he is on foreign policy, I think it's not a maybe. I think you have not had a U.S. president with this depth of knowledge, personal relationships, exposure, and depth of relationships within DC. You know, Brian's had a milkshake with him. 
you know, I, I don't know whether Alex has or not, but it's not a big deal. Honestly, I don't think it's a big deal if you're in the foreign policy and national security business in the U.S. And, you know, you would have come across, uh, you know, Senator Biden. He was chairperson of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee or the ranking uh, senior member, I think, for almost a decade and a half. So which is it, Kaylee? Is it going to be the pragmatism or is it going to be countries like Israel and algorithms like Twitter that are going to dominate the day when it comes to U.S. at odds? Well, <laughs> I think here, obviously, I think we're all hoping for pragmatism. And, and I think that's going to be um, the intention from the start, whether or not that's actually what's put into practice and what comes through, I think does depend on a lot of the actors that you've you've already named. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons to have have confidence in Biden. Um, your mention of, of, of social media and Brian's mention of sloganeering, I think um, kind of does come down to the fact that we're talking about very complicated, very nuanced issues. I mean, I don't know how many countries we've named in our hour long discussion or all of the issues we've raised, but there's so much to unpack here. And so this idea that people can kind of get hung up on, on, on one thing one phrase, one way of interpreting something and kind of hold that as, as their kind of dying point of, well, you're not gonna persuade me to this 10 year vision that you have of how to <laughs> slowly move towards some kind of greater, you know, slight degree of regional stability, which is really what we're talking about. I mean, that's really hard to go to a Republican member of Congress and be like, it may not be my residency, you know, who knows, but like, you have to trust me on this. Um, we're not at that place and place in Washington, I think most people would say. And I think that's something that, you know, Israel and, and all of its years of, of lobbying and getting involved in U.S. domestic politics in an attempt to kind of push push its own agenda, um, it's it's leveraged those, those divisions well um, in kind of the original experience with the JSPOA to kind of have, have a lot of voices here. Um, voice and echo some of its own concerns that it was already presenting towards the Obama administration. I think when we talk about kind of the hyper polarization of politics, um, that's also happened in this in the case of Israel. I mean, I think you know there was largely bipartisan support for for Israel in the United States for many many years, and now you've kind of seen the degradation of that support, and it's becoming more of a polarized topic in terms of well, how do we actually treat Israel as the partner that it is? To what degree can we critique it? Um, and, and so I think you'll see some of that played out uh, under the Biden years, and it'll probably become less of a, of a private fight, so to say, or private disagreement of how do we work out kind of our differing perspectives on how to move forward on Iran and, and likely become a public fight, um, which I think is to the disadvantage of both, of both Israel and the United States when it comes to actually making progress um, on concerns that that the two countries share within the context of, of the Iran um, issue. So there's a lot of hurdles um, that Biden faces. And I think a lot of those hurdles we've talked about in, in the um, external sense, in the regional sense, in the, in the case of Iran, um, but also exists really domestically at home. Uh, and what I'll conclude with is, is that there is going to be <laughs> an uphill battle on the hill in terms of how Biden messages and engages with congressional um, players on kind of his perspective of how to pragmatically um, re-engage with, with Iran and reach resolution on, on some of the concerns that people have. I think Biden um, may even share some of them in regards to, to the regional uh, behavior of Iran in regards to sunset provisions, um, but, I think sometimes what we've seen is even when people kind of agree on an end state, the path to get there um, is, is harder to share. So I have some hope, um, but also I think more realistic explanation, expectations of how all of this is gonna play out. And I think that's why we've put so much emphasis over um, you know, the course of the conversation on timing and on who the players are um, in regards to within the United States and not just Biden, but but who he's chosen and, and even the more um, middling managers. And, you know, I think Alex has kind of said it, it doesn't really matter who, you know, who wins the presidential election in Iran because the Supreme Leader is kind of the seat of decision making power. And I agree. I think there's just the bot, the, you know, the another layer to all of this is just like, we have to have 
two people kind of picking up the phone on either side. Um, you know, who the Biden is going to have to put his team in place. There's going to need to be a team in Iran who's actually willing to have conversations about these issues. And then, you know, it's hard in the U.S. for people to come to the same place about even what language we're using to talk about things. Um, so I hope I think it would be easier to speak to a team in Iran who maybe does have some experience or, or was there for the JSPOA experience. And and we're not kind of doing a technical education all over again, that there is this kind of starting point, this foundation, you know, when Brian says taking the old as a bridge to the new, I think that's really important, not just as a strategic framework, but in like the literal sense of how do we actually get this done? Yeah, I, I think on I, I think that's a brilliant point. The the the, the mechanics of, of getting a, a deal done and 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 I think for a lot of people, they're going to enter the White House or or the State Department or you know Langley or um, the Pentagon with. Uh, maybe with the baggage of of kind of having exited in December of 2016, uh, you know, this kind of, was it, it was 16, right? That was in the, the election was. Yeah. The, yeah. 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 So it was in December 2016. Uh, Brian's face had, threw me off no, a no, little I bit thought, there. Yeah, the, no, the deal. Uh, I thought you were talking about the deal. He, he waited until uh, 2018 to pull out. Yeah, so. no, I was I was talking about the, 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 the yeah. you know, the transition, the last transition in the U.S., and now we have yeah. one four years later, uh, uh, Lukas. You know, so many of these things. When I when I think about, when I add the Europe lens to it, it gets dramatically more complex, right? Like, you know, I think we've mentioned Syria a couple of times. I want to talk a little bit more about Syria and ask you to to kind of explain uh, what what the actual reality is. But one perspective on Syria might be that we've seen so much of a kind of Daeshization. Uh, of of uh, enclaves of Muslim communities in 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 Europe, uh, I think the U uh, the UK and and France probably most starkly that was very specifically radicalized through Syria. So when we talk about the regional impact of Iran, I mean it's it's you know this might be a stretch for some, but to me it's a it's a straight black line. There's no dotted line even. When Iran behaves the way it does regionally, it creates knock on impacts that have domestic social policy implications for countries like the UK and France. Is that in fact a consideration in terms of the interest that these European powers have in a return to some, some kind of normalization for Iran? Or is it purely kind of big game stratagem and, and it's, not, it's not actually impacted by their domestic considerations? I mean, I, I don't really see a straight line here. I see a very, very complicated path and you have a number of other things, uh, other streams that add uh, to the problem and, and to the challenge which we have. But before I, I go to that, uh, just briefly uh, to, to uh, uh, respond and add to what, what Kelly said and, uh, and Brian, um, because uh, we are also seeing in Europe, of course, the uh, pitfalls of the policy making in the United States and the polarization of uh, views on a number of issues, uh, but Middle East and, and Iran would probably be uh, around the top of the, of the agenda. So of course, there is a lot of thinking of, you know, how can we help? Uh, how can be a way of, of service of arriving uh, at this reasonable policy, which for me personally is, yes, a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new uh, deal or kind of uh, compliance with the old deal to, to get to something uh, better. So there is a, a lot of papers, uh, colleagues at the European Leadership Network, colleagues at the European Council of Foreign Affairs come up with all these nice ideas that we can do some lobbying on the hill, uh, we can provide mediation, uh, we can maybe talk to the friends and allies um, in the in the Middle East, uh, which is of course fine. And the question is, you know, how effective we are? Uh, are we treated seriously as interlocutors? Are we treated seriously as as mediators? Because if the United States and Iran, uh, at certain point, want to talk to each other, they find a way that don't necessarily go to Brussels. They go through 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 other places. But you no, know, certainly uh, there is a willingness to to assist. 
Um, but you know, assist not in the terms of uh, yeah, let's all hug the Iranian regime and we all live happily ever after. But uh, how to manage this very complicated and a kind of multi-dimensional uh, problem uh, together? Uh, now to the to the issue of, of of Syria. I mean, the United States is not the only country that caught its um, Syrian policy horribly. Uh, rock and you know uh, did not really get what it what it wanted to get. A, a number of European countries uh, were in the same position, and some of them, including France, including the the, the United Kingdom, uh, also put uh, their troops uh, on the on the ground. Uh, so uh, I think the the issue of Syria is is the issue of a, a great moral and political hangover. Uh, and the question is, uh, how can we uh, at least uh, diminish the, the negative uh, consequences of the catastrophe that, that our Syria um, policy um, is, at the same time, uh, without uh, actually uh, somehow supporting uh, the, the current regime. Because, by the way, this is a, an idea that the Russian colleagues frequently put on the table. Uh, let's all rebuild. Let's let's rebuild Syria together under the leadership um, of Bashar al-Assad, which is of course unac unacceptable to us. Um, when it comes uh, to to the issue of the Daesh ideology, let's uh, let's listen to the people from the countries themselves and from the cities themselves, because the image that you sometimes get outside of Islamized Europe of no-go zones, uh, Sharia law being introduced, this really has nothing to do with reality. And the latest controversy around the, the French policy, I think, is the best example that, you know, let's let's be let's be honest and let's get the facts first. Uh, radicalization is the problem. Uh, attacks, uh, either inspired by Daesh or lone wolves, uh, is a feature of our lives. Uh, but no, it's it's not an existential struggle that it's sometimes portrayed from the outside. Well, the question I had wasn't. Uh, I certainly I agree absolutely, and I mean we should do a whole separate panel on on France itself uh, and and what you know kind of the empty centrism of uh, President Macron actually means. But but I think the question I had wasn't so much that it's an existential challenge domestically, uh, as much as it is that. The vacuum of governance and you know the, the war or the conflict in Syria, which certainly was fueled, if not initiated by Iran, has created the, this whole generation of, uh, I mean, hard-on violent extremists, um, many of whom traveled to Syria, uh, fought the Iranian militias, and then went back to their home countries in the UK and other parts of Europe and represent a clear and present threat, not only to society writ large, and I think you're right, it's often overstated uh, from that perspective, but certainly represent a threat to the integration and assimilation of uh, immigrant second, third generation Muslim communities in Europe. So, so I, I guess my question was, I'm gonna turn this to Alex, is that, you know, on the one hand, you know, the contention is that Iran's regional behavior has many knock-on effects, and one of them is this kind of problematization of Muslim uh, communities, both Shia and non-Shia communities in uh, in Europe and, and, and the U.S. On the other hand, you know, uh, Alex, it's equally valid for somebody to make the argument that the only reason Iran had to step in was because the other parties uh, in these in these conflicts, whether it was Turkey or Russia or the Saudis or or the Qataris, uh, you know, which is the most interesting one, just given Qatar's size, that all of these actors are the ones that have actually uh, poisoned the the pot, and really Iran has responded to a natural vacuum, partly because of the sectarian question and partly because it is a legitimate power in the region. So. How do you square those two different sort of uh, proposals? Are, are they one and the same thing and, and just different angles of perspective? Uh, thanks. Look, I'm certainly no expert in terms of Muslim integration in Europe. I lived in Europe for 20 years. I happen to be a citizen of two European countries that care deeply about Europe's future. 
uh, I mean, very quickly on the sectarian issue, uh, I mean, you know the demographics. Uh, Shia Muslims are a tiny minority of the overall Muslim immigration across Europe, but it's North African, Turkish, otherwise. And those Iranian Shias and Iraqi Shias and other Shias you find living in Europe have fled Shia Islamism. That's why they uh, arrived in in Europe the last few decades. So I, I don't really see Iran as a big player. I mean, if you talk about the imams, the mosques, the messaging that comes out, oftentimes the countries that are funding those types of radical Islamism messages uh, are obviously, that's not Iran. You're going to look at other countries. Iran has its own issues, but they're far more limited. Iranian-sponsored mosques or in Islamic centers are f- few in, in Europe. Uh, but Musharraf, let me go to a point you made earlier. You you kind of uh, disciplined me, and it, it was good. You needed to. You said, look, you know, Alex, you have no idea on what the Iranian population sentiment is. And you're right. I don't. I Nobody knows. That's the thing. In some ways, you could argue nobody knows. But when you have someone like Ruha Lazam, this Iranian journalist who was just executed, being executed because he spread misinformation, disinformation, was a counter-revolution, it was a threat to the system, you know, you ask yourself the question, if that's how nervous the regime is about one individual, one website, what does it tell you about the system? What does it tell you about the ability of this system to stay in power. And frankly, what is it that keeps it in power? You could argue that if you take away the arms and the intelligence services and the repression techniques of the Islamic Republic, there would be no Islamic Republic left. And I think that's exactly the message for the likes of Ayatollah Khamenei. Ayatollah Khamenei right now could be the individual who could pave the way for a whole different relationship with the region and with the United States. He could the, exactly the way Ayatollah Khomeini did. Before Ayatollah Khomeini did in 1989, the, his inner circle asked him and said, sir, you're the only person who can a- end the Iran-Iraq war. And he did. He ended the Iraq war in 1988, a year before he, he died. Khamenei, I, I have no idea how long he would live. He could live another 20 years. He, but he, as I said, he's getting old. Um, he has a chance to create a new environment, a new framework, not just for the United States, but also Europe and the overall regional framework to sort of go away from this is uh, this pursuit of militant Islamism. As I said, uh, it, it, Iran is not the only guilty party in the region, but Iran was the first one in 1979 to start exporting the revolution. He was very proud to do so. We all remember Hezbollah in 82 and all the other organizations that Iran over the years has funded. And if you believe that future of the Middle East is about sovereignty of states, respect for one another, and you know the United States can perhaps play the role of the mediator, then Iran needs to accept that there are neighboring states like Emirates, like Saudi Arabia, like Bahrain and others who do want the United States at the table. That Iran can put the United States out of the region and hope that Russia and China would come in and, and sort of help Iran uh, to whatever he wants to achieve geopolitically in the Middle East. In other words, what I'm saying, Musharraf, is, uh, you know, when I look at Iranian society, I see Iranian society desperate for nation building. Iran is not, and the Iranian people are not the only ones. I live here in Washington, D.C. Many, majority of Americans want nation building first, too. Uh, so, but you have a country that is under sanctions. I mean, I can sit here and give you statistics about how much these sanctions have cost Iran in terms of uh, economic damages. Uh, the inflation, the unemployment rate, the suicide rates, the marriage, uh, you know, r- rates collapsing or people not getting married at all and so on. There are all sorts of issues that this Iranian regime has to confront. And if he stays on the course of just wanting to sort of, you know, consolidate in Syria, consolidate in, in elsewhere in the region, it comes at a r- big risk for itself. It would be in the region. It would exercise overreach and it has to then potentially face, uh, you know, upheaval and other sets of upheavals and maybe even a revolution, although I won't usually want to go there because it's a big word revolution. But what I'm saying is that's the message from Iranian society. They don't want a revolution. They much rather have Ayatollah Khamenei wake up tomorrow morning and say, okay, you know what? Let's just turn a page. There's a new uh, American president. The region is going in a different uh, direction. We seem to be getting uh, fewer and fewer friends on our side. Maybe we need to recalculate. That's the kind of thing I think a majority of Iranians would want to welcome. And I actually think a lot of people in the region wants to welcome it. When I travel 
like we all do on this panel to the region. I don't hear anybody say Iran has no regional interest or shouldn't have any regional interest. It's not that. It's what is it Iran wants to do? And the Iranian message for 42 years is we only have, we are the only ones with the right message. Our message is the only one. And we, you know, we're going to stay the course. And that just can continue going forward. And that, at least that's how I see it. Yeah, I think maybe maybe uh, in a lighter vein, maybe maybe Americans are too used to Pakistan, you know, sort of bending over backwards to do, uh, you know, whatever Uncle Sam wants over over that same forty year period. So much of the so much of the instability and and uh, and conflict is is um, is synchronized, right? I mean, the Iranian Revolution, uh, the Soviets going into Afghanistan, and then you know, basically. Uh, non-stop sort of a uh, torture for the people of Afghanistan um certainly some people in Iran if not all and and you know the poverty levels and the lack of economic growth and and uh stability here here where, where I'm sitting here in Pakistan all point to the regional nature of this and the and the multilateralism that Brian and and Kelly and, and really all of you have talked about is certainly something to aspire to but we we only have a couple of minutes left Brian and I, I just I want I want Kelly we started with her so we're gonna go back to her to end off Brian very quickly how realistic is it that the Biden administration is going to be able to? I'm going to ask Alex and Luca as well before we get to Kelly. But very quickly, how likely is it that a bridge deal, uh, not exactly G JCPOA, but something uh, that is similar to that, will be achieved within the first six months of the administration? And if that doesn't happen, then are we not risking events taking over plans? Um I don't know what the probability of that would be. It largely depends on, I think, the calculus of the leadership in Iran. And as we've talked about, there's a transition that's happening there, as well as th these elections this spring. Um, my hope is, and, and if there's a consistent theme, is my hope is that pragmatism will prevail, that people will see uh, in Tehran that there's a window here to try to de-escalate. Um, and to to get things back to where they once were. I'm not certain that's going to happen. And one thing I, I should highlight, and I meant to highlight this earlier, is that I'm I'm extremely worried about what could happen in five weeks time with, with Donald Trump still in office. Um, there are various signals, and all of this is in the press, of Trump looking at different options. My assessment is that his so-called maximum pressure approach on Iran was such an abysmal failure. And I say that based on their own goals, based on their own objectives of where they want it to be. They are nowhere near where they want to be on Iran, or I would argue on many of these Middle East files, especially the Israel-Palestine front. They are so far fallen short and in some cases deteriorated the situation. So. I'm punning on your question in part because I think a lot could happen between now and January. And I actually have some very negative scenarios in my own mind of what could be done in ways that actually could produce even more instability. And my, my bigger concern is then how do we pick up the pieces um, and move forward? And that's where I think a policy of Biden quietly engaging the region. And by that, I mean not just the autocrats and the authoritarians, but also trying to lay a template out over the long haul of trying to listen to the people of, of, of these countries as well. Again, a novel approach. I'm at a think tank. Uh, I'm kind of an academic. Allow me my reverie here that we could actually make not only diplomacy matter, but then the voice of the people matter and not get caught in these memes that we've had about uh, false choices between sort of engagement uh, means regime change or that we need to have a militarized approach to it. So, I, I, you know, to answer your question, I hope that they get to some form of an understanding. I think there's enough incentives there, um, purely in part because of the pandemic and how awful it's been not only in this country, but for the people of Iran as well, that we've got human security challenges we've got to deal with. Uh, so hopefully there'll there'll be a concerted effort on on de-escalating come January 21st. My worry is what happens between now and January uh, uh, 20th. 
Thanks, Brian. That's, that's, I think, a really helpful, very scary, actually terrifying sort of prospect because uh, picking up the pieces will, will invariably include, uh, include not just Pakistan, but Afghanistan as well, um, not to mention all the other countries where Iran has active you know, conflicts. Um, uh, Alex, a quick yes or no, first six months, will, will the Biden administration be able to establish at least a bridge deal of some sorts? Yes, if you put it to me that way, I, I, I mean, I had to be very, um, yeah, I think so. If they really want to, I, I suspect that's where they're going to go, Musharraf. I think they know that it's, it's not, uh, this Iranian regime is, isn't any prettier than it was in 2015. In fact, it's uglier in some ways. Uh, but the fact is, if you are President-elect Biden and his team, what comes first? What I hear, uh, and, and Kaylee and, and Brian knows this much better than I, what I hear is that they're going to put non-proliferation at the top of their agenda, uh, not the region. So if that's what it is, it's the nuclear issue, then that's something you can work around. Because the Iranians desperate trying to get away from the sanctions. I mean, they're hurting badly on that. And the risk for them, which was always, I agree with Brian, the maximum pressure campaign did not deliver what it was meant to deliver. It hasn't. Uh, but it was meant to put them at the, on the brink. Uh, and force them to, you know, to make big concessions, and they never did. And that was partly, hugely, because the Trump administration was much more, in, in terms of its Iran policy, was actually much more about other countries than Iran. It was about the Gulf states, with Israel, it was about U.S. domestic politics, it was about getting the anti-Islamic Republic crowd in the United States excited at election time. And all that. It, it never had a coherent Iran strategy. It, for example, the Trump administration never tapped into the Iranian opposition. Never. I mean, President Trump famously tweeted many times in Persian. Nobody else has done it, but there was no strategy behind it. I mean, I can tell you the Iranian opposition today is in as much disarray as ever been. So, I mean, one thing I say about the Biden administration is never forget that your biggest tool, uh, once you get that short term nuclear deal uh, in the bag again and you provide some concessions on sanctions relief to Iran, which includes exporting oil and letting them get their money back from banks in places like China and India. Then when you're going to go for the heavy lift, don't forget this is a regime that has a population that is extremely upset with it. And that's a nuclear energy, if used wisely, can only force the Iranian regime to rethink where they're going, particularly now with Khamenei having to pass on the baton to the next individual. Do they want to stay on the course of militant Islamism or do they cherish power for the sake of power and are willing to maybe change some of their political dogma and go in a different direction at home, but also in the region. So that bit of optimism with, with the caveats, Alex, thank you for that. Lukas, uh, similar question, yes or no, but, but feel free to explain it um, as Alex has. Uh, will we see a, a, a quick bridge deal in the first six months of the Biden administration? I'm siding with Alex uh, and I'm optimistic uh, on this. Uh, there is indeed a, a convergence of interests uh, between Iran when they really think about it, what's important for them, uh, and the, the Biden administration. Uh, and, you know, uh, if there is anything that, uh, you know, everybody in the Biden administration, a higher echelon is on the record, it is to say that pulling out of the JCPOA was a mistake by the Trump administration. Uh, so coming back to the very beginning of our conversation, um, I think we should, uh, I mean, Biden really means it when he says if Iran comes back to compliance, uh, we are coming back to, to JCPOA. And he's willing to take the flag uh, in, in, in DC uh, for doing it because I think he thinks it's a, it's a good thing and, and a proper thing to do. Of course, it's not the end of the story. It would not be the happy end and it would just be the end of the beginning uh, of, the, of this administration's adventures in the Middle East. But you know, at least that would be uh, something. Uh, as, I, as I tried to explain before, there would be a, a lot of people cheering for this kind of outcome. Uh, there would be a lot of people trying to prevent it. Uh, so I, I think the U.S. administration uh, would uh, be, well, I mean, it would be ad advisable to look for uh, allies, but also to present something to the to the opponents of the deal and those who have uh, concerns um, about uh, the deal. Um, so, yeah, cautiously optimist. Final word goes to Kelly Thomas. Uh, 
based on the discussion and all the other discussions you've had, the research you've done, um, have you been moved in either direction? Or are you still where you are? And, and where is that? Are we going to see uh, a deal in, in the early days of the Biden administration? I think the best chance for a deal within the first six months is really just a clean mutual re-entry re -entry to the JCOA. That's where I was before this discussion. I think a lot of elements of this discussion highlighted that. Um, well, that's the best option and maybe the simplest of all of the ones. That doesn't mean that simple, as we've clearly demonstrated. Um, and that is, as Lucas says, really just the end of the beginning. There's going to be a great lot of work to do following that. But I really think that is kind of the greatest imperative. Um, for both Biden and the Iranian regime, you know, constrain the nuclear program once again and and get Iran. Kelly, Thomas, Lukash, Kalesa, Brian Katulis, Alex Vitanka, you guys have been amazing. Promise me that you'll come back in June, right before the election. We'll do another one of these and we'll sure. revisit the things that we said um, and, uh, and and see, see how well the U.S. and Iran have done to try and bring their people both people, but certainly the people of Iran, uh, probably more so, some kind of relief from these sanctions and and uh, and the regime itself. Lady, gentlemen, thank you once again, and uh, join us uh, very soon for the next the Lab Policy Roundtable. Khudafiz, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.